The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Yolanda Kabuka Masoke, Stakeholder and Events Manager at SIPFA, and I'll be moderating today's session. Today's session will focus on the ways in which councils understand and measure their carbon footprint so that they can plan and prioritize actions to reduce their most significant sources of emissions. We will also explore what lessons councils can learn from wider sustainability reporting practices. Also, the global public sector with a specific focus on the UK local government context. This webinar has been organized alongside ADEPT, who have been fundamental in the programming for today's session. They are the body that represents local authority and directors of place across England. They are the directors responsible for commissioning many of the day-to-day -day services delivered by councils, including local highways, recycling, waste, and planning. I would like to take this opportunity to remind you that this session is being recorded and will be available to view on our YouTube channel in a few days. Today's session is formed of three speakers and will be followed by a Q&A. I encourage you to ask questions using the question box. Please note that you can ask a question at any time during this session. That being said, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Eleanor Roy, Policy Manager at SIPFA. Good morning. Oh, Good morning and, and thanks Yolanda for that. Um, this morning I'm going to, perhaps very appropriately as I am sitting in Glasgow a couple of miles away from where last minute negotiations are taking place at COP26, and I'm going to talk this morning about SIPFA's research on sustainability reporting, which we carried out earlier this year. Our international report looked specifically at climate reporting across the entirety of the public sector. So not specific to local government for this first se section, but absolutely of relevance to the rest of the, the session this morning. It's becoming increasingly clear that the climate impact in some form is going to have to become part of everyday reporting in the public sector. And we believe that this is a change that we need to embrace. So the climate crisis, as we all are all aware now, sits at the top of global political and economic agendas. We see the practice of sustainability reporting becoming much more widespread in the private sector, which is a positive trend. But in the public sector, we find that we're lagging behind our private sector counterparts. One participant in one of our roundtable discussions put this very clearly, carbon is carbon. The planet doesn't care who produced it. And this goes to the heart of why climate reporting is so important to the public sector. With our research project, we aim to provide a baseline from which we could track the evolution of public sector reporting. And we set out to identify what public sector organisations around the world are currently doing to report their impact on the climate and to identify some of the challenges and opportunities that they're experiencing. We conducted an international survey of public sector professionals around the world and hosted a series of um, regional roundtables. We carried out a series of structured interviews with experts in the field and also um, the standard desk-based lit review. Our participants included the entire spectrum of the reporting process from practitioners, academics, auditors, and standard setters. And clearly, I'd like to again extend my thanks to all who supported us and participated in the research. Sorry, the slides are on a bit of a delay, so bear with me. Sorry, it doesn't like my middle one, the one that I want to go to next. You just <laughs> we'll tell me when it's next and I will do it for you. Fantastic, Yolanda. Thank you very much. Can we have the next one, please? There we are. Thank you very much. So it's important to recognise that in the context of climate change, the public sector has a dual role. It's a provider of the public services that we're all familiar with, such as law enforcement, healthcare and education, but it also functions as a regulator, setting the rules and standards for 
wider society and business. So that means that the public sector impacts on the climate both directly via its own actions and indirectly through this regulatory activity of wider players in the economy. So the extent and nature of public sector activities are critical to the achievement of climate objectives. Reporting on climate issues enables governments to demonstrate how they're addressing the most pressing challenge of our generation, but it also enables them to be held accountable for their performance on climate change. It provides information that is crucial to better inform decisions that need to be made to deliver better outcomes. There are challenges which need to be overcome, which we'll talk about shortly, but properly assured reports can make a difference in not only the final outcomes, but in the, the whole process of decision making from planning right through to demonstrating that impact. So in our research, we explored four key themes. First, we looked at the global landscape of public sector reporting. Then we looked at the preparation process for those reports. We looked at assurance and accountability. And finally, we looked at the capacity, capability and communication of such reports. So if we can just flick to the next slide, then I'll talk through each of these in turn. Thank you very much. The first issue that we encountered was that there was no clear and agreed definition of sustainability across the public sector. It's, it's an interesting world and it can mean many different things to different people. We focused in specifically on climate and environmental reporting, but recognising that sustainability also has a wider, more broad definition. But even looking at what constituted climate related or environmental reporting, we found that there was no standard interpretation. We also found that those who are preparing such reports demonstrated no consistency in the framework that they chose to use to base this on. We identified a dozen different frameworks that could potentially be used, but none of these were geared towards specifically towards the public sector context. There was very strong agreement amongst our participants that work to align and harmonise these standard setting arrangements should be a priority and that this needs to happen with consideration to how these frameworks could apply to the public sector. There was also a view that there needs to be a greater commitment to sustainability reporting in the sector. We found a great appetite for such reporting amongst those that we, we worked with in this research. And we found that where it is happening, it's often done on a voluntary basis with very few jurisdictions making such reporting mandatory for the public sector. Institutional commitment was viewed as an essential prerequisite for sustainability reporting to become common practice across the public sector. We identified a number of benefits of producing such reports, the most common being that it raised awareness of the impact on climate and the natural environment and gave better visibility of the social and environmental issues. Cost savings and better economic and financial outcomes were less frequently quoted um, by those that we spoke to in our research. In identifying these benefits, it seemed that once a report is being prepared, the information is valuable in influencing the decisions and, that are made and delivering better outcomes on the environmental and social matters raised. From the landscape perspective, there was a strong and consistent view from our participants that the public sector should not delay the sustainability report in Germany. There may be challenges and issues along the way, and it may be that it's starting small to begin with, but it's recognised that the process will need to evolve and adapt over time. And so the journey should start sooner rather than later. We have the next slide, please, on the preparation process. So, in looking at those that were currently preparing such reports, it was clear that across the public sector, this type of reporting isn't its infancy. 
less than half of those we surveyed confirmed that their organisation prepares such a, a report. Amongst those that are doing so, two thirds of them used one of the established frameworks that, that we identified, which means that a third are adopting an alternative approach. A number of limitations were commonly identified, um, including the absence of good quality data, the absence of a framework specific to the public sector, and the lack of a mandate to produce such reports. The most commonly cited issue was lack of data. Um, and although this was identified as an issue for those that had made the commitment to report in, they did state that starting to use the data that they have to begin to report actually acted as an impetus to address the data quality issues. They said that the process of beginning to report actually acted to improve the quality and reliability of the data available. We also find there was little consistency in the choice of framework, but despite those differences, there was a similarity in terms of the content of the reports produced and unsurprisingly, harmonisation of frameworks taking account of the public sector context was viewed as a high priority. Another finding was that where take up of sustainability reporting in the public sector has been limited, is, is partly due to the lack of clear policy parameters. So where an organisation's policy supported reporting, they all had produced a report. That's perhaps unsurprising, but clearly it demonstrates that the local policy agenda is an important enabler. Again, unsurprisingly, the majority of those preparing reports, their organisation had clearly established sustainability objectives showing the importance of reporting to demonstrate the, the progress and achievement against sustainable development. Almost 60% of those producing a report included targets for the measures identified in the report, yet it was interesting that few of our respondents were able to identify how those targets were approved. In terms of why the reports were being produced and the audience that they were intended for, the majority of those reporting identified the public and their local community as the primary reason for, for reporting, together with organisational reporting for accountability purposes. Um, and only 13% of those that responded said that they had an organisational mandate to produce such a report. So if we can move on to assurance and accountability. This was viewed as being essential for ensuring sustainability reports were robust, reliable and credible. A key point that was made um, during our discussions was the need for assurance to mitigate against the potential risk of so-called greenwashing. Um, and a large number of our participants perceived this to be a significant risk in climate reporting. However, assurance was not common practice amongst those that were reporting. Despite the strength of the view on the need for assurance, only 25% of reports prepared were subject to audit or verification. We had a lot of concerns that unfavourable audit outcomes early in the reporting journey um, might limit the further uptake for um, reporting in this way. So, in other words, if we're not entirely sure, how to begin this journey, we're not particularly keen to open it up to audit at that stage. Um, however, where reports were audited, the audit was generally conducted by an external third party supported by internal resources. There were no instances where a supreme audit institution was involved, um, which was seen as being a limit to accountability arrangements but this may be reflective of the lack of a mandate for SEIs to audit such reports. In terms of auditing, two main challenges were identified, very similar to the preparation process. The absence of an established framework for preparation okay. and the absence of specific... Yeah, audits. not okay. great. Um, is it possible for me to still go into the delegates yeah. so I can see on my no, iPad? 
from the organizers. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So throughout the research, we identified the availability of guidance for um, audit, but it was limited to um, Supreme Audit institutions who were found to be less involved. One of our participants made the point that involving the Supreme Audit institutions like the NEO can be positive as they are very good at getting parliaments and their committees involved in any issues that they look at. And, and this is a really important accountability mechanism which could be applied as only 17% of those reporting stated that the reports were subject to any form of scrutiny. However, some jurisdictions, including the UK, have already implemented institutional arrangements linked to climate concerns, such as dedicated parliamentary committees. Scrutiny and parliamentary oversight were perceived to be key drivers of demand to improve the quality of data that was available to report. So if the demand is, is there from outside to, to, for accountability purposes, then there's an increased drive to produce the data and, and therefore produce the report and increase the quality of the report. But right now, with few reporting mandates in place and concerns around the maturity of the reporting process, it may be that a phased approach to auditing and assurance could be worthwhile. Um, maybe looking at things um, over an, a, a couple of years as the process evolves. But as one participant quite clearly noted in one of our roundtable discussions, if sustainability reporting is not mandatory and it's not audited, in their view, it wasn't particularly worthwhile. If we can move on to the final theme on capacity and capability, I think this was a key theme that came out of our research. Um, capacity and capability were the key enablers that were essential to not only the prepara preparation of climate reports, but also the audit and assurance. Um, the lack of specialised climate science expertise among staff was highlighted as a particular issue. Of those that were reporting, 60% of them had a dedicated sustainability team responsible for the preparation of that report. And interestingly, this was not generally led by the finance profession. Having the necessary expertise affects not just the preparation of the report, but also the audit and verification. So the broader skills and expertise are required for our reporting practices to become mainstream all the way through the preparation and audit process. And whilst we find that finance professionals were generally not in the lead for climate reporting, it was recognised that there's a leading role for the profession in the preparation and communication of reliable and credible information, albeit that this may be non-financial reporting. And that's because finance teams have the expertise in delivering robust and reliable information and in developing the mechanisms, reporting structures and control frameworks to support this kind of external reporting. So the finding really was that the, the ultimate would be a multidisciplinary team encompassing all the, the knowledge and skills required. In looking at the nature of the reports produced and how they were communicated, we found that in practice, integration of climate information into wider reporting was fairly limited. Um, it was felt that while the release of standalone climate data can assist in raising awareness and increase the focus on sustainability, that integrating it with other forms of reporting was critical as it provides a more comprehensive picture of an organisation's overall performance and therefore can better inform decision making by providing the, the, the big picture, if you like. Again, amongst those that were reporting, we found that um, it, it wasn't particularly mainstream. The majority of those who were producing reports stated that they only used one channel to communicate the report and that that was generally via um, a website or similar form of communication. So if you can move on to the next slide, please. We identified 
to our work, seven key areas where further development is needed for reporting in the public sector. We need clarity on the definition and scope of such climate reports to ensure that there's a common understanding and interpretation of what constitutes this form of reporting in the public sector. There is a need to accelerate the alignment and harmonisation of existing frameworks and standards with a view to a framework that is appropriate for the public sector to underpin sustainability reporting. It doesn't need to be for the public sector alone, but there has to be an eye on how it could be applied and implemented in that context. There needs to be greater commitment to sustainability reporting at the institutional and organisational level to add impetus to the maturation and evolution of the process. Um, there needs to be prioritisation of the development of the expertise needed to support quality reporting. And in terms of audit and assurance, there needs to be a recognition of the key role that this plays in this report, and including consideration of phasing and assurance arrangements, given some of the um, concerns around the immature nature of reporting in the public sector. There are a number of opportunities through integration with wider forms of reporting where we could avoid duplication and provide a more holistic view of organisational performance and therefore better informed decision makings and, and strategy to achieve climate objectives. And finally, there needs to be greater effort to promote and strengthen institutional arrangements for the oversight and scrutiny of such reports. And if we can move on to what is my final slide, um, as it says there, if we flip, hey, you're getting a whistle stop tour of the whole talk again. Um, thanks, Yolanda. As it says on the slide, the research that we did is, is the tip of a very large iceberg. Um, we hope it provides a baseline from which we can start to chart the evolution of public sector sustainability reporting. But there is much work to be done to turn the um, green shoots that we've seen in the public sector into more robust and consistent reporting. The entire report is available as a PDF on our website, but we also produced what we hope is a slightly easier read, perhaps, in a more accessible format, which is available on the SIPFA website um, via the link that is provided on the slides. And I'd just like to thank you for your attention this morning and for joining us with our partners at DECT in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellie. And now to introduce our next speaker, Joe Wall, who's Strategic Director at Local Partnerships. Joe, I will pass you control. If you have any issues, I will move your slides for you. Hello, good morning. Um, for those of you who haven't come across me or local partnerships before, um, we're an organisation that's owned by the Treasury, the Local Government Association and the Welsh Government, uh, and we provide services into the public sector. Uh, my role at local partnerships is that of Strategic Director for Climate Response, uh, and we provide um, services uh, to central government departments and local authorities in particular, but uh, mainly in from my respect in terms of carbon baselining, um, auditing people's uh, baselines, uh, production of net zero strategies, uh, support and delivery of actually projects themselves, and also uh, net zero trajectories for those of you who might have declared climate emergency and, and be actually aiming towards net zero. So as part of that work, um, I don't think I can move them down, actually. Um, if you wouldn't mind doing my slides and clicking when I ask you to, that'd be great. So, oh, it's there. <laughs> Perfect. I can do that for you. That would be great. So, if I could have my next slide, please. So, um, one of the things we do, which is um, different from any of our, our competitors in the sector, is um, we're here for the public good. And so we actually share our intellectual property. Uh, and back in 2020, we produced a greenhouse gas accounting tool, which um, we produced actually for our own use with our clients. Um, but I could see absolutely no reason why we wouldn't um, put that into the public domain. So that's exactly what we did. Um, 
through the local government association and that tool is free to download and use for any local government or any public sector body um, either on our website or the local government association website uh, in terms of providing some assurance around that the tool has also been reviewed both by the cdp which used to be the carbon disclosure project but i believe they now just call themselves cdp um, and also bays uh, who produce a lot of the carbon intensity factors, so they have actually checked our workings as well. So what we've been seeking to do here is providing a standardised approach, reducing the dependency on consultancy for local government um, uh, and helping to actually uh, reduce the workload by just providing um, some standard tools that can, can be used in this space. Um, if I could have my next slide, please. So in terms of, of actually what the tool is aimed at, if you could do one click for me, please. Um, if you look at emissions, so um, in, inside the red circle there, you've got um, fuels that you would burn directly yourselves uh, and your purchased electricity. And that's where we started with the tool. So for those of you familiar with the scope terms, that would be your scope one and scope two. Um, if you could click again, please. Uh, we have been working with the LGA um, over the last 12 months to actually build and develop more functionality into the tool because we're being asked for that by councils. So um, we are now um, able to report on quite a lot of scope three functionality, but this is all still council operations and the, the intention is to stay with council operations. So our tool is not intended um, to, to measure area wide emissions. There's plenty of other tools that do that, things like scatter or the, the data that Bayes produce um, that you can download from their website. So this is very much a focus on, on your operations. It's been picked up by the Climate Change Committee as part of their sixth carbon budget uh, and um, as signposted to. Uh, and to our knowledge now, around 200 um, to 250 local authorities in the UK have now downloaded the tool uh, and quite a number of them are starting to, to use it and use it more as the functionality has grown. Could I have another slide, please? So um, in terms of, of what we actually do with this, we keep it under regular review. We run alongside it an FAQ function uh, where we will provide some general advice if people have got specific queries. Uh, and we keep under review additional data requests and areas that people would like us to develop. Uh, and once a year, we, we try and produce a refresh that incorporates as much of that as we're able to do. We've also been working with the LGA on providing some sector specific guidance in particular areas. Um, uh, and most notably for those of you who are um, top tier authorities, uh, we have provided guidance with the LGA specifically around adult social, sorry, no, adult social care, social care generally. Um, and how you might actually account for that in a fairly practical way. Um, if I can have another slide, please. So in terms of the tool itself, it will produce information um, in two formats for you. One is around um, tables that can be incorporated straight into reports and the other is, is graphical output. Um, so rather than everyone going away and building their own spreadsheets, not only to calculate the data, this actually will give you outputs that you can drop straight into reports. If I can have another slide, please. So um, typically uh, why we would do this and, and why this is important, um, this slide represents what I often see when I go into a local authority and I look at their climate emergency action plan, um, which would quite typically in many instances contain between three and 400 individual activities. Um, if we're actually gonna tackle the climate crisis, crisis if I can have a click please, um, we need focus and we need to really focus on, on what's important. And I can tell you sitting here that in terms of the, the fuels you burn yourselves, um, your scope one and scope two, buildings will be at the top of that list, probably followed by um, street lighting for those of you that have street lighting, and then it'll be transport from your own operations. If I can have another click, please. Um, what I would say is that whilst accounting is really important, actually, we know the general direction that we need to travel in. Um, so it's certainly not worth holding projects back, waiting for reporting to be in place. Um, it, it's relatively easy quite often to identify what low hanging fruit are and, and to start making good progress. And certainly from my observations in the sector, I think the vast majority of local, local authorities certainly are doing that. If I could have another click, please. If I can give me the other two. Um, so this one is about data and data has been mentioned by the previous speaker. Data is really important um, and certainly um, we have judged the Climate Leadership Award with for the MJ for the last two years and um, what we do find there is that the authorities make most progress. Uh, both have really good data 
uh, and they understand their, their emissions, they understand the impact that they can have on that, um, and they integrate that properly into their decision making. Um, in terms of actually what we need to do, a lot of it's relatively simple, but what we need to do is to do it at scale and pace. So rather than trying to have one of everything and having those action plans that have got three or 400 activities, it's really important to hone down on the few things that are actually really going to make a big difference if you do them at scale and you do them at pace. Um, so they will be building energy efficiency measures, they will be fleet reviews and, and replacement of vehicles, rather than, for example, replacement of plastic straws in your canteen, which whilst laudable is, is actually not really going to do a huge amount to reduce emissions. Could I have another slide, please? Um, someone's typing, I can hear as well. So in terms of the information that's required, this is kind of the front end, the, the, the business end of the, the calculator. Um, Organisers, I'm not sure if everyone's muted, but I can hear quite a lot of interference in the sound there. That's better. Um, so in terms of the, the tool itself, it, it collects information that you would typically have um, in many of your financial systems anyway, um, or elsewhere in the organisation. So things like your you know, your gas consumption per kilowatt hour, um, how much electricity you buy, what type of fuel you put into your vehicles. Um, and there is functionality that will allow you to input that um, either as uh, litres or, or mileage. Um, we try to make that as flexible as possible. Um, Organisers, I can hear someone else on the line, please. Could I have another slide, please? So I thought today that I would try and leave you with a, a little bit of a thought about where your focus ought to be. Um, so in terms of things that you should be doing at scale and pace, um, now and over the next couple of years. Uh, renewable energy very much up there uh, and actually energy storage. So projects like that would typically have payback uh, and may have payback of sort of um, seven to 10 percent, depending on what kind of scheme you've got. But there are certainly real opportunities um, to generate electricity and, and actually make cash savings. Fleet, um, particularly small vehicles, uh, rather than the larger vehicles at this stage. Um, but again, most of those provided they've got a reasonable duty cycle, uh, actually it, it makes economic sense to change those over already. Um, building controls and management systems, um, that sort of stuff is, is absolute meat and drink. Uh, and, and even outside of the public sector decarbonisation fund, there's been funding available on an investor save basis for quite a lot of those projects for a long time. Um, and also solar thermal, I would, would put into that category now. In terms of coming soon, we can start to see, um, so what typically happens is you try and grow a market. If you can grow a market, the costs fall. You've seen that with things like solar. So solar PV um, is actually my background. I was installing solar PV in solar farms in 2010. At that point, we were paying about 2,300 pounds per kilowatt um, to install. Uh, currently, solar farms are installing at the UK at about 480 pounds for exactly the same equipment, in fact, probably better equipment. Um, and that happens, um, as you see, you see it with smartphones, you've seen it with all sorts of things over the years, where glo as global deployment kind of doubles, um, the price tends to halve. Um, so what we're starting to see is support mechanisms go in to support the development of a market and then they get withdrawn. So um, we know that the government at the moment are putting money into air source heat pumps, heat networks, hydrogen, um, EV charging, but that, that I think is, the, the, most of those uh, will be, things that you might be mandated to do rather than you'll necessarily expect to make a lot of money out of particularly the EV charging unless you happen to have sites that are suitable for rapid charge locations. The other thing that's a, a developing piece and one certainly to keep an eye on there's quite a lot of grant money around at the moment for tree planting and other forms of landscape sequestration and recovery. Um, some of those may well be if we end up with some sensible form of carbon trading may well actually become real assets in the future and there are also instances of local authorities who have started to introduce carbon reporting um, into their decision making and actually account for the value of carbon uh, when they're making decisions to actually um, help them support decisions to to do more of the the climate mitigation work or adaptation work that they want to do um, if i can have my final slide please uh, I think from me this morning, that's probably um, it, other than to say thank you for listening. Um, if, you, if you've got further queries, happy to answer questions on the Q&A, uh, and alternatively, my contact details and those of my colleague, Rachel Torres and Awa, who is more of a specialist in carbon accounting than I am, uh, are both available for you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Joe. And now to introduce our final speaker for today, Ariane Crampton, who's the Head of Climate Programme at Wiltshire Council. Good morning, everyone. Um, good to be here this morning. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we've used the carbon accounting tool in Wiltshire as a bit of a case study. Um, so uh, we trialled the initial version of the tool back in 2020 um, when it was a bit of a pilot and we provided feedback which has been used to shape the latest iteration which as joe said is obviously work in progress and uh, will be continuously improved um so we have two years experience of using the tool at the end at, at year end um i think the, the key things that we found from using it is it's very easy to use um it's really comprehensive as joe said so um even between the first version and the second version we really noticed that it had um, it includes a lot more. So, for example, we had never previously included on our, on our greenhouse gas returns um, the emissions from our wood pellets, from our biomass boilers. Um, we haven't included our fugitive emissions, um, but those are easily captured now using that tool. Um, we also find that the collating of fleet emissions is really easy because you just literally have to categorize your fleet into um, size and type of vehicle and then uh, give the mileage um, against the fuel type, and then it works out what the uh, emissions are from that. Um, as Joe said, there's options for capturing things like outsourced fleet, water consumption, material use, so that's things like food, drink, IT equipment, paper, plastic, and waste from our own operations. We haven't used those functions yet because we don't actually have that information, but it's good to know that as we collect the information, we will have um, the opportunity to feed it into the sheet and have it all in one place. Um, the transmission and distribution losses from electricity are all calculated automatically, which is a bonus. Um, and if, like us, you don't have very detailed information about your um, business mileage and you don't know exactly what kind of vehicles your staff are traveling in, you can just use the average median car conversion factor and just put the mileage in for, um, from mileage claims. So that works really well. Um, there is um, also, the option of just logging whether you're on a green electricity tariff within the spreadsheet, um, which we are, but at the moment, there's no way to bring emissions to zero for a green tariff, which is what we would ideally want. So that's um, hopefully something that will be worked on. Um, we found local partnerships really responsive uh, if we have any issues with using the spreadsheet. And um, the other thing that we think is going to be really beneficial is to use uh, to be able to benchmark with other local authorities and to be able to compare what we've got um, with what they've got and um, share best practice and so on. Um, everybody was asked to upload the tool um, by the end of October so, so that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to benchmark. Um, in terms of how I found the tool in working with my colleagues in finance, um, what I found was when I showed them the tool, they immediately recognized it as a sort of typical accounting tool. They were very comfortable with it. Um, and I felt it was really, uh, it add, added value because they were asking questions about what had been included in the scope because they obviously know what's included in our accounts. And they were basically saying, so have you included this in your carbon account? So in that sense, that was a really valuable conversation. So that's probably all I've got to say, um, but hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into what it's like uh, in in terms of using using the tool in a local authority. Thank you very much, Ariane. So we'll move over to our question and discussion segment. So please feel free to um, pop your emails in the question box. And just bear with us one moment. Okay, so our first question is, for tools such as the carbon counter and purchasing carbon allowances, are they no longer in place? I don't actually know what the carbon counter was. Um, sorry, but as, as far as I'm aware, there isn't um, 
another tool does what um, our greenhouse gas accounting tool does that is free to use uh, and aimed at the public sector. Okay. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, another question for you, Joe, is can you recommend any tool for financial accounting of carbon in decision making? I don't think there is a specific one at this stage. Um, what normally uh, people do is uh, identify carbon price. So the Green Book would have some thoughts on carbon pricing. Um, and there is some emerging market in things like woodland carbon units uh, and pricing from that's available as well. Uh, so the local authority that I'm aware that have done some of this is Cambridgeshire um, and it, it might be worth having a look as well at, at what they've done but I don't think there is a standard practice or um, developed methodology that's widely adopted. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question is how easy is it to upload historic data um, a local authority has collected for GHG reporting? If you want to use the tool, it's it's pretty straightforward to be honest with you. The tool takes the top end data anyway, um, so it doesn't do like the a lot of the basic number crunching that you would have to do to bring some of that data together. It's more um, about bringing it into one place, recording the assumptions that you've made and tracking that sort of thing. So all you do is you change the base year, um, and that will change the carbon intensity factors in the tabs, um, and then you you rebuild it in each year. Um, and then we would recommend you hold those together in one folder so you kind of see the journey that you've been on. Um, there will be a need for local authorities to rebaseline from time to time um, and, and other public bodies. So, for example, if you had a significant change in your estate, um, you might want and need to, to rebaseline. So um, having that historic data, having a clear list of the assumptions where you've drawn your boundaries, um, whether it's a financial control or an operational control boundary that you've taken, what assumptions you've made about outsourced services, um, that sort of stuff is, is always really helpful to, to have um, as you compare year on year as well. Thank you. Um, can the data in the tool be disintegrated to prioritise buildings for investment and retro profit? or retrofit, sorry, I apologise. Can it be disaggregated? Um, you would normally build it up from spreadsheets. So um, there is, yes, you can put line by line data into the buildings part of it. Um, so you can see what existing use is. Um, there are tools available. And this, what this doesn't do is calculate the gains that you will have from specific projects. But Bayes produce carbon intensity factors for those. Um, for specific things that you might want to do or if you have um, if you're going to do energy efficiency work you would normally expect your provider to be able to provide you and, and hopefully actually guarantee you um, savings as a consequence of the works that they, they're going to do and they, those guarantees should both be in terms of financial and carbon savings. Brilliant and this is um, for both Ellie and Joe. do you think climate reporting requirements should be mandatory in the local government sector? Ellie, can I go to you first? Um, I would say that the, the majority view from the research that we did was a resounding yes. Um, however, I think that has to be approached with an element of caution um, because there are already a number of mandatory requirements for reporting and the last thing we want to do is add to the burden so I think that some form of mandation around reporting, whether that be through recent suggestions that we've seen at the Environmental Audit Committee, where there's been suggestions that there should be a framework or similar for um, local government's overall approach to climate, whether there should be reporting elements included in that. Um, I think we have to we have to exert that element of caution, but there was a very clear view from our research participants that if it's not mandated, it's not going to happen everywhere. Um, I think in local government, there's probably not so much of a need for for forcing, if you like, reporting, because I think there's an appreciation that there are these climate strategies in place 
there's an understanding across the local government community of the role that they can play and are keen to play and that if they're not reporting on it they're not charting their progress um, but as a bigger picture then yes I think there is a need for mandation of some form. Thank you Ellie. Jo? I think it's a really interesting question um, and it's certainly one that I have heard discussed um, both with Bayes and, and with the LGA actually um, and I think it's fair to say that there is quite good support for mandation in the sector. Um, I think certainly the LGA would be really cautious around it because whilst there's good support there are also a few authorities and they're all members um, who, who wouldn't support mandatory reporting. Um, what I've seen when we've been out with groups of local authorities is that um, some of them are cautious about what's reported and um, what tools would be used. So we've seen some caution around our tool with one or two local authorities because they're nervous there might be algorithms in there and things they don't understand. There's not, there's very simple formula that multiply emissions factors by the amount you use. There's nothing difficult in it at all. <laughs> um, where I think the real difficulty comes though is when you seek to use that data to compare. So um, local authorities are so different in the service clusters that, that, that they have, how they provide those services, um, and there's also a really strong link between rurality and carbon intensity as well. So if you provide services in a rural area, you will typically have a much higher carbon footprint um, than an urban authority for the, by population size. So generating benchmarking data that is fair is actually quite difficult as well. So the purpose of reporting and why you would be doing that, I think would need to be really clear um, so if you are comparing with your own performance, I think that's really valid. I think if you're then seeking to try and make swathing assumptions across the sector, I think that becomes much, much more difficult. We've been trying, as Ariane said, to gather data back from local authorities and put it into LG Inform, which is the LG's database, the, 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 the LGA's database that um, all local government and actually most of us have access to. Um, and, and start to use that to try and develop some near neighbour benchmarking. Um, to date we haven't had enough returns to make that really worthwhile but if we can get more returns then that could become a really useful resource for local authorities to actually be able to look at their near neighbours in terms of, so a near neighbour in um, LG, uh, LG informed terms isn't someone who's geographically close to you, it's someone who might have a similar profile in terms of service provision, population size and that balance between urban and rural. Perfect. Thank you, Joe. Um, Ariane, are you still there? No, not for now. Okay, perfect. I am. I am still here. Sorry, I just had to find the unmute button. <laughs> That's okay. No problem. Um, could I also direct that question at you, which was, do you think climate reporting requirements should be mandatory in the local government sector? Um, I mean, they used to be, so we're all quite used to doing it. Um, you know, with the carbon reduction commitment, we all used to report on our on our um, carbon emissions every year. Um, it used to be compulsory to submit greenhouse gas reports every year um, to Department for Energy and Climate Change at the end of July every year. That that was sort of in force for quite a few years. So I don't think it would be very difficult to sort of reinstate that. Um, I think a lot of local authorities have just carried on doing it. So yeah, I don't think it should be a problem. And, and it should definitely be something, because you can't manage what you don't measure. So unless you're measuring stuff, you don't really know how to tackle it. As Joe was saying, you, you, need, you need to prioritize, you need to know what the big sources of emissions are. Um, and the only way to do that is to measure it. Brilliant, thank you. The next question is, does the local partnerships tool account for closed landfill site emissions? If not, how are councils approaching this challenge? Do we start with Joe? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> waste is, is an area we've been looking at, actually, um, in terms of, of where we might go with waste emissions. Um, I think um, there's already quite a lot of data out there from RAP, and we don't want to duplicate what's already there. Um, so I think the first place to go would be to go and look at what 
the RAP data is. I think measuring methane emissions from closed landfill is quite difficult. Uh, by definition, most of them have gas engines on them until the methane um, emissions are, are, are relatively low. Um, so, I mean, I've certainly seen ones that have sort of three megawatt engines that are, are down to 100 kilowatt before they, they decommission them. So the methane levels coming out of them do degrade over time. Um, but methane is a, is a gas of really serious concern and unmitigated methane emissions, um, particularly on a larger scale, are, are something we, we need to make sure that we avoid. Um, and with mandatory food waste collection, um, we are going to have to have means of, of dealing with um, that or, or that is going to become uh, methane emissions that are unmitigated. Ariane, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, it's not something that we've got experience of uh, personally in, in Wiltshire, sort of looking at um, closed landfill sites emissions. Um, probably something we will need to tackle at some point, though. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, Ellie, this question is for you. What role do you see SIPFA playing in the future of sustainability reporting? Does LG accounting need a wider rethink in terms of reporting on issues that are important to the public? I think that's the killer question for SIPFA at the moment. Um, and it was part of the reason why we undertook the initial piece of research um, looking at you know, what was happening across the sector. Um, and we have spent the latter part of this year thinking quite hard about that and, and how we might be helpful um, in this space. And I think there's probably a, a bit of a dual role there. So I think with our international hat on, we're quite keen to 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 look at, you know, the 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 frameworks that are available and we, we're very aware of the IFRS announcement that's coming this week about the uh, sustainability standards board. So we're keeping a very close eye on that. Um, but also with a bit closer to home with our UK local government um, community. And um, so we're looking at the moment at what we, we might helpfully do without perhaps putting our usual heart on and starting to set standards as a first step. Um, so it's something that we are we are looking about and we are talking to partners and talking to our networks and our regions about and, and getting some feedback from our members. Um, and we've also been keeping a close watch on some of the, the parliamentary inquiries. So one of my colleagues was at the Environmental Audit Committee a few weeks ago feeding into the um, local government net zero inquiries. So we have we've not come to a firm decision we are still collecting views on how we might be helpful but as i say it, it's a, an area where we are not particularly keen to run in and start setting standards that might not be the most helpful route for the sector um, but we are keen to support any any views any views from audience members please do drop me an email Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, Ariane, this question is for you. Um, do you have any tips? Do you have any tips for councils considering using the tool for the first time? I mean, I think the tips would be more around data collection because, as Joe says, um, what you feed into the tool is the kind of uh, the sort of the final figures that you've collect collected for for the various different sources of emission. Um, the tricky bit obviously is collecting that data in the first place, uh, making sure you have smart meters for your electricity, for example, making sure you have a mechanism for measuring if you've got any oil boilers that you're using, for measuring you know, how much oil you're using. Um, it tends to be far more difficult with liquid fuels than it is with electricity where it can be much more easily metered. So getting on top of measuring everything and knowing exactly how much you've used in the financial year, taking reading, is probably the the first thing to do if you've not done you know a, a sort of one of these returns before thank you very much um this is an open question so councils are purchasing renewable energy from the grid when developing baselines for emissions pathways do you count these emissions as zero or use the location-based method 
Should purchasing of renewable energy from suppliers form a major part of reducing emissions from energy use alongside others like efficiency and on-site generation? Would you like me to start on that one? Yes, please. A little bit of a specialist chosen subject, this one. Um, so let's start with um, how you account for it. So how you would account for it, and, and Ariane's touched on this, the tool does not account for it. It doesn't give you the ability to do that. And it doesn't give you the ability to do that because the correct way to account for it is to make a below the line adjustment for renewable energy. So the reason for that is because actually the focus on using less is the primary focus. So you continue to monitor how much electricity you use. So over the course of the next few years, we are going to see um, both heat and transport largely migrate onto electric sources because um, that's the only way you can deal with your scope one emissions, your directly burned fuels. Your, your electricity emissions, as we decarbonize the grid, and we will all have seen the Prime Minister's announcements that 2035 is now the target date for grid decarbonization. Um, then basically electricity will become a, a carbon neutral resource eventually. Now, in terms of renewable energy, it's a really difficult question. Um, so in terms of accounting, you need to be really comfortable that the source that you have for renewable energy actually is properly renewable. Um, and, and that's not just saying I've got a Rego certificate, so a renewable energy generation of origin certificate, that's not enough. Um, because those can be traded separately from the electricity. Um, but also understanding, so if you've got, for example, a big six um, green tariff, those green tariffs um, would typically at the moment identify a source that your electricity is coming from. However, it doesn't mean that they haven't extracted that from their wider production. So you'll make, your purchasing green actually makes somebody else's electricity dirtier. Uh, and more carbon intensive. So those are really not a recommended way of, of actually dealing with um, using renewables. Uh, On-site generation, obviously absolutely perfect. Um, in terms of off-site direct PPAs with um, new generating stations, um, and there've been some really high profile examples of that in the sector, City of London would be at the forefront of that. Um, there are others who have also gone down the route of purchasing assets if they're unable to develop. Um, some of that's slightly more difficult with PWLB and there's certainly a bit of a lack of clarity um, around the, the consultation that came out in December as to whether that's going to be allowable, particularly in relation to the question of economic area. So there's, there's lots going on in that kind of space, but renewable energy is part of the, the story. It does certainly take a big chunk out of your emissions, um, but it shouldn't be your primary focus. Your primary focus should be to reduce what you need um, and then renewable energy, um, if you do either develop or uh, acquire a, a renewable PPA, great. Um, the sooner you do it, the, um, the sooner the better, frankly. Um, and, and that's back to the comment that Ellie made in her presentation about carbon and, you know, it, it doesn't matter where it comes from. The longer you leave it, the more carbon there is in the atmosphere. So the sooner we can do that, the more we can do to kind of accelerate the, the development of renewables in the UK. Great. We need, if we're going to hit that 2035 target, we need to something like quadruple our existing renewable energy supplies. Sorry, I've shut up. I've gone on a bit there. No, it's okay. Thank you, Joe. Um, we've actually reached um, 10.30, so it is the end of this um, webinar. Um, just to conclude, I just want to thank um, Ellie, Joe and Ariane, and also Adept. Thank you very much. Um, we haven't managed to go through all of the questions, so what I will do is work to get written responses to the remainder of the questions. Um, so I'd like to wish you all a happy Friday um, and a good weekend. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.